So hello and welcome to this unique crossover podcast between Medical Mums Chat and CODA. I'm Dr. Chris Bowles, I'm an emergency and trauma physician. I'm Nada Hamad, I'm a haematologist. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're recording, the Camry Gal and Gadigal people. I'd also like to give a massive shout out to the medical parents, largely mums, who've been doing it tough during the pandemic, squeezed at both ends, both at work and at home. Today we're going to be talking about gender equity. What is it and why does it matter? We're going to take a deep dive into gender equity in medicine and talk about the effect of the pandemic. And then we're going to start talking solutions. Nada, what is gender equity and why does it matter? I think this is a, a very good question. I think a lot of times people think gender equity and equality are the same things. And I make a distinction and in general, I think that distinction is accepted, that equality is where you want everyone to be treated the same. And equity is trying to level the playing field. So uh, leaning into the reasons why um, inequity might exist or uh, especially why women don't progress in their profession or in representation and trying to level the playing field so that there is more representation and more participation in the workforce and in, in career progression. And I think in medicine for me, uh, you know, I've thought about this a lot and the epiphanies have come over periods of time in my career and in my personal life where I recognized that, you know, once upon a time, I didn't necessarily see any inequities or inequalities that weren't quite apparent to me. And then over time, these became very clearly apparent as I progressed in my career especially around times um, in the workforce where I was a bit destabilized. So, for example, during, um, you know, pregnancy and coming back into the workforce, that was a time where it was very obvious. Um, times where I wanted to move into leadership positions or into higher positions, that again became more apparent that there was an issue around equity. But in more recent times, I'm recognizing the impact of gender inequity in medicine on patients on research. I'm a clinical trialist and researcher. And so starting to identify where it is in medicine that gender inequity has really manifested in terms of how we look after women. So how we learn about how we look after women, the kinds of questions we ask in our research, how do we perform research, and then how do we apply research in the context of um, women's healthcare. And often women's healthcare is, you know, discussed in the context of fertility and pregnancy and childbearing, but in reality, women are people, so they have all sorts of conditions. And the evidence that supports the treatment uh, of these conditions in women is actually very, very much lacking. And so there's an inequity of data and knowledge. And um, there is definitely a inequity in how we learn about how to look after women. So, you know, although my first exposure to inequity personally felt, a, you know, for me around the workforce, career progression, you know, getting ahead in medicine, that's where I kind of started to feel it initially. I've started to recognize the breadth and depth of this inequity in the profession in general, uh, particularly its impact on patients. So that has very deep roots, which extend to, to patient safety, actually. Um, so what are the key issues? What's actually holding women back from equal participation in the workforce? Look, there's a, there's a lot of factors and we have to understand, you know, medicine was born in a very patriarchal, um, you know, white male environment. That's where it came from. It evolved over time and women started to, I guess, you know, come into that workforce, pushing for representation, pushing for their rights to be part of the system. But that doesn't mean that the system changed to accommodate them. It means that women you know, fit into that system. They worked really hard to accommodate and change their lives for that system. Um, and, you know, I, I think when you look at it, really, you start to think, well, this was never designed for women, neither the, the profession nor the systems that have been designed to deliver healthcare. The hospital system in general isn't designed for women, patients or clinicians. And so what is holding us back is really a framework that is not conducive 
to engage with women, to, to you know, celebrate women, to include them in the workforce in a very meaningful way. So I think women are still trying to fit themselves into a construct that is not necessarily conducive for progression and inclusion, uh, you know, not just for women, but if you look at it intersectionally for a broad range of people. So diversity is not something that we have really put a lot of effort into. And I think, you know, with diversity comes so many advantages. It's not just for women. It's, it's, it's for the workforce and it's for patients, better ideas, better solutions, better systems come from a diversity of thinking. Um, and if we, if we don't invest in that, we're not going to get the best people involved in our healthcare systems and healthcare solutions. And we're not going to get the best outcomes for our patients and our communities in general. Um, so I think system redesign is something I'm very passionate about because COVID has really highlighted that yes, we can change systems and we can change them quickly. Depends on the reasons that we're doing it and the pressure to do it. You know, so many times that, you, you know, women would say, you know, do we really have to have meetings at ungodly hours where we cannot participate and so shy away from those um, positions or jobs that require us to be, you know, at, in the hospital system at certain times. The rigidity of the system meant a lot of women would shy from certain specialties and certain roles. And now we can we, we can work from anywhere. We're seeing patients remotely. We're doing meetings remotely. We're doing meetings all around the world and connecting with people from all around with, you know, a click of a button. And And that is something that although COVID, I feel, has been problematic for women, this is the one thing that I hang all my hopes on is the experience and the historical precedent that there is no there is no we can't do this anymore there's no um it's not possible to change a meeting time it's not possible to do things this way or that way it is you just have to want to absolutely um i wonder if at this point we should talk about the hidden labor performed by women traditionally it sort of seems like hospitals are really a little like any other workplace um, although the, the possibilities for part-time work are, are there um, but there's an assumption isn't there that that the doctor the nurse whoever it is has a wife at home taking care of things you know making sure that the children are fed and off to school and there's someone around waiting for the computer guy to come you know it's whatever it is you know there's a certain amount of labor that's being performed in the home um do you think it would help to share that a bit more equitably oh, yes it would so let me put it this way I, I have a partner who's a wonderful partner who's a stay-at-home dad and i often you know joke and without disparaging him say he's just not a wife in the traditional sense of the word because, you know, you know, people who have wives at home or traditional gender roles where wives look after everything, they, you know, the social calendar, the children's play dates, you know, just the, the emotional labor of all those tiny things that women tend to traditionally do, you know, make sure that the kids' shoes aren't growing out or the next set of clothes is in the drawers and in the cupboards. And, you know, all of these really small tasks that um, are traditionally homemaker tasks. Even men who choose to be at home or support their partners or try and take an active role are not conditioned or trained to take on those roles. And it's a challenge for women to engage their partners in these tasks, even when they do have that support. And that's very rare. I have to say, you know, amongst my colleagues, not many women, you know, even if they're both medical partners, have partners that are willing to engage in, in, in that mental and emotional load of looking after the home or homemaking in its traditional sense. Um, so, you know, there's an assumption, first of all, that women want to do this and want to take part time roles because um, that's their preference. But in reality, many women are forced to do that because they just don't have the buy in from partners or the flexibility in their relationships to do that um, and do full time work if they choose to do it. And even when they do choose to do it, there are a lot of assumptions imposed on them. You know, if you're working full time, oh, are you sure you can do it? You know, you apply for a position. There's a lot of questions about who's going to look after the children. You know, how are you going to manage your time at home and your kids? And if there's any 
evidence of capacity limitation in terms of, you know, people asking to do extra shifts. Oh, well, you know, shouldn't have taken this position if you can't, if you can't do the extra work required. Um, with that really consideration that everybody has capacity limits. And for women particularly, there are cultural and societal capacity limits imposed on women that they really can't get out of. You know, for me, my husband's great. We do a lot of things um, differently. I'm certainly the more organized of the two of us, but I still have to do things like planning ahead, organizing social calendars all, for all of his best intentions. Um, he's just never been trained to do those things. And, you know, we've been together for 20 something years and a lot of those years have been training to do some of those tasks that I was trained to do just almost implicitly in, in my childhood. Um, and I think in the healthcare system, in, we, we don't really take into account or consider what women have to do. We, we front up, we show up, we've, you know, pushed our way through into a very male centric environment and system. And no one says, okay, how do we help you continue your engagement and your commitment and your um, work? How do we help you do that? Um, and having worked in a lot of countries, I have to say, we're just in Australia, not quite um, considerate around this issue. In, in, for example, in Canada, you know, hospitals have daycare centers attached to them. You know, you, you, your kids can go to a, a daycare facility within the institution so that if there's any urgent emergency issues, you can just go down in the elevator and turn up and look after your kid. Um, you know, sick leave and child care leave is much more flexible. There are people to cover you if you need to go for an emergency. Um, our system is not quite built like that. There's not much flexibility. There's not much cover if people are sick or they need to go look after a, um, a loved one or a family member. We're quite tight in our human resources and um, that makes it very challenging, I think, for women uh, because it's assumed that they will be the one that needs to leave should an emergency occur. And, and for, for practical reasons, that's just the way it is. Yeah, and so this is why we need women to have a seat at the table so that we can actually drive policy. Um, it's, I don't want to make it sound too negative, though. I think there are many kind of advantages to, to being a parent. Um, I think certainly as a doctor, I've, I've really benefited from being a parent and I, I'd encourage you know, parents of all genders to, to take that on. Um, it's a very humanising experience. I think, you know, for all of the different degrees I've done, the, the training I've done, the life I've lived, being a parent was probably the equivalent of a PhD each time I had a child. Like, but the kind of skills you learn are acquired so quickly and you, you, you sort of get this superpower of intuition, of um, human communication skills, nonverbal particularly, because the kids can't talk uh, for a very long time the ability to focus on and prioritize important things and, and hone in on that, get that done, and then move to the next thing and the next thing. And the ability to look after multiple stakeholders. You know, I had three kids, we're a household of five, everybody wants something different. And the ability to harmonize that, and I'm not successful at it all the time, but over time you get better. You, you learn how to manage people, um, and their competing interests and, you know, their pressures and stresses in a way that is so um, natural and organic. And you just learn how to do those things. Um, and it's not saying that the only way you can learn those things is being a parent. It's just a really efficient way to do it. And so if you bring that into your clinic or into your practice, it does make a big difference. Um, I personally think I'm a better communicator um, and probably a better doctor for it. It's not the only way you can be good at these things, but you know, it's it's there for for the system to leverage that skill set of women. It makes us good at our jobs, and um, instead of I guess thinking of it as a negative asset, but to think about it as a positive asset and leverage that. The more women in the workforce in medicine, the better patient outcomes are. And that's been shown in a number of studies. So it's not us kind of saying, oh, we're just better at it inherently. It's actually training 
and um, you know it's born in, in in research. You can see that there is evidence that women, you know, introduce better outcomes for patients, both men and women. In this kind of crash course in soft skills, whether we like it or not, mm. and that actually is a benefit to the workforce. I guess the other thing I want to pick up on that you said is that we're only looking at women sometimes at job interviews at the point at which they're at and not necessarily looking at their potential. Um, and I think we're actually losing potential here because we, we're sort of putting women into boxes. You know, we used to say, oh, women must work part time and that's kind of how they continue. But I think these things are really dynamic and there's a time for women to step up or, or the primary parent to step up later in their career. Um, you, you touched on intersectionality. Can you just tell me a bit more about how that works? So intersectionality is a, um, it's a, or, you know, it's a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a law scholar or legal scholar in the US. She's a professor in Columbia. And the idea is looking at, um, you know, different aspects of an individual that may determine, um, you know, their position of privilege or power or oppression in society in general. So, you know, the, the, this kind of combined world that we live in between the law, politics, media, culture, and where people sit is really a combination of multiple um, features in, in, in that individual or characteristics that can mean that they have higher positions of power or lower positions of power. And they sort of compound each other in a big way and small ways. So for example, even though um, you might be an English speaking, um, very uh, educated black person, you may have less privilege than a socioeconomically disadvantaged white person, depending on the circumstance. So depending on public media perception or public perception um, biases that may exist implicitly or explicitly uh, in terms of the legal uh, environment or cultural environment. So it's really how micro and micro, macro inequities can intersect between different characteristics of an individual. And there's a really wonderful resource online. If you Google wheel of power, you can say it, as you can see this big wheel and in the middle, um, you know, power is attributed mostly to white male, uh, heteronormative cisgendered uh, individuals. And it's sort of, become, you become more and more marginalized as you move away from that. So if you're someone who has multiple disadvantages, you're more likely to be more disadvantaged than an individual that has one or two, for example. And you can think of patients, for example, maybe members of the LGBTQ community who are also disabled, who are also ethnically diverse, gender diverse, all of those things all packed into one. That person in a very, is in a very, very um, low position of power compared to the other extreme. Understanding that is really important in medicine because you want to be able to offer medical care for everybody. You don't want to cater to only the predominant uh, powerful group because they may not even be the group that needs the most care. So you really need to rethink um, what intersectional uh, perspectives may be in our, in, in our community and then bring those to the forefront for equity's sake, if you know what I mean. So lifting people up so you can you can level the playing field rather than just treating everybody the same and being blind to everybody's disadvantages, that doesn't apply um, to medical compassionate practice because you want to be able to cater to those who need you the most. So um, intersectionality means that you don't look at the one factor. So gender is one of those things. We don't want to just look at gender as a singular factor where we say, you know, we just want women to, to do better in the workforce, because if you do that without considering that there are certain women who have other disadvantages that need to be considered also, particularly women of color, then you're going to miss the opportunity to bring diversity into the workforce, to bring those perspectives into the workforce. So it's more efficient to be intersectional than it is to be focused on the one um, characteristic. So it sounds as though some training in the unconscious bias would actually be potentially quite effective in addressing that, um, you know, when we're talking about leadership within medicine. Absolutely. I'm not sure how effective it is in the long run to achieve what we want to achieve, but it is at least effective in um, demonstrating the 
implicit bias you might have, and that's the first step. Acknowledging one's privilege, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful things we can do as individuals. Learning about, for example, the wheel of power, learning about intersectionality, and, and thinking about where our privilege is, because that's how you learn to use your privilege for the good, the greater good. That's how you learn how to serve your community, your um, your society, and your culture by by using whatever power you have to lift everybody up. If you lift everybody up, everybody comes along. So, uh, you know, I think if we can't do that and we can't teach doctors to do that, that's a, that's a certain um, opportunity lost. Um, so I feel very passionately about implicit bias training, um, intersectionality training, and I speak a lot about this in, in, in general medical circles because it's an idea that needs to permeate further. It's certainly an idea that's there in the public health sector but it hasn't actually made it through into clinical practice or clinical education or research yet. And I think we've got a way to go there. Yeah, and it's interesting that you've referred to those. It, it, it strikes me that these issues affect each area of medicine, you know, both clinical and non-clinical. So we have these issues within clinical medicine in terms of outcomes. Um, we've got gender and intersectional issues also affecting research and education. Do you want to tell me a little bit more about the effect of those? You know, uh, I, I think, like I said, it, it, some of these epiphanies came to me um, as I grew older and wiser. And I'm not that old and I'm probably not that wise, but I'm on a journey. And these epiphanies are welcome when they do come. And I, I recall when I had my first child, my first cesarean section, and, you know, the experience was not a positive one. I have to say I've had three kids and they were all kind of the same. And I never quite delved into why they felt so uncomfortable and unpleasant. I didn't have that, you know, glowing, positive, supported feeling that a lot of women get. And there was a couple of comments made in my first delivery, you know, when I was in pain and I wasn't actually getting very far uh, in, in my labor. And one of the nurses said to me, Oh look, you don't you don't need an epidural. Your people are really good at this. And I didn't really quite make much of that comment other than to say, please, I really need this epidural. And you know, my obstetrician had prescribed it and it was, you know, it was something that was discussed and discussed and discussed, and that was the decision that was made. And it was just felt like it was delayed and there was there was a lot of reluctance to pursue it. In any case, you know, I kind of paid no attention to it. And even after the delivery, you know, I was in a lot of pain. And every time I would ask for pain relief, I would be discouraged from taking it. And that might be um, a reasonable thing to do from clinical practice. But I was in visible distress, you know, in tears, doubled up. And and I remember thinking, you know, I'm a, I'm a hematologist and I deal with pain quite a lot. And I would never watch a patient, you know, in the circumstances that I was in without feeling a sense of, you know, distress for them or want to help them. And at one point I was on the ground in the corridor, just in agonizing pain and I couldn't get up and nurses were just walking past me and, you know, nobody came to my aid and I asked for help and, Oh, look, you can do it. Your people are great at this. You can do it again. That was the second time it was mentioned. And I, again, didn't pay much note, uh, notice to it. And many years later, about 10 years later, um, I went to a talk by an obstetrician, a woman of color, and she was leading a, a webinar on um, uh, outcomes of women of color in, in their birthing experiences. And I was so overwhelmed by the sheer number of stories that were exactly like mine. And that was the moment I thought, oh, my God, this was a system thing. This was this was an environment just to, didn't see me as a patient. I didn't under, understand my needs and the biases that can occur that might lead to a negative outcome in my particular circumstance. So although I didn't, you know, it didn't click 10 years ago, it certainly clicked 10 years later when I started to find that there's actually research to demonstrate that women of color have negative obstetric outcomes. They're certainly denied pain relief much more commonly um, and that there's a lot of dismissal of concerns that they may raise. So that moment for me was very um, 
eye opening because I started to think to myself, okay, well, if this happened to me as someone who can advocate for myself, I'm educated, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a physician, I understand the system, I work in the system. And if I couldn't speak up for myself and, you know, you know, get the best outcome for me, what do other women of color have uh, a chance? They really don't have a chance. Um, and then I thought, well, what is it in my practice that could be failing my patients? And then I had to rethink my medical training and go back and look at that with an intersectional lens, start to think about who am I not doing a service, uh, an optimal service, who am I not um, really seeing the way I ought to see. And that was amazing. Like for me, that really broke my mind for a while because I started to think about, well, you know, when I look after female cancer patients, what am I missing? And there's a lot because it's the data that we use to offer women treatment is based predominantly from research that mostly includes white men. And so there's clearly going to be gaps in the knowledge that I'm using every day to treat everybody. In my mind, I'm treating everybody the same. I'm offering them the same treatments for the same cancers but I'm basing it on data that's derived from a particular group in the population and it may not apply. And the more you look, the more you find that yes, there are disparate outcomes for gender, ethnicity, and other parameters that are not in the data. And we like to be evidence-based. You know, we want to say we're basing our medical decisions and advice based on data. But what happens when the data is not there? What happens when we haven't made a deliberate effort to be inclusive in the data gathering and being cognizant that if we don't include the people that we treat, we're not going to be offering the best care possible. Um, so my personal experience really opened my mind to questioning, you know, medical education and training and the research and how we apply research data. Um, and I'm learning every day. Honestly, you know, every time I go to a gender equity, diversity, inclusion conference in, in clinical research, I find something new that I think, wow, this is, this is really important that we rethink their past. We rethink how we design medicine for the future to be inclusive. And the best way to do that is by being intersectional in our mindset. So this is really about thought leadership, isn't it? It's, it's reshaping medicine at a profound level. Um, I want to stay there and maybe go a bit deeper, actually, because it seems that the pandemic has compounded many of these issues. For, for sure. And, you know, looking at some of the data of outcomes coming from other countries, particularly the US and UK, and looking at the, dis, dis, the differences in outcome between genders and, and ethnicities, that are completely separate to socioeconomic status. The way people think about ethnicity and race um, in medicine is still quite rudimentary. Um, you know, it's often linked to, well, certain ethnicities are associated with certain socioeconomic status and therefore healthcare outcomes are poorer because those patients are either uh, disadvantaged financially or disadvantaged because they have different comorbidities but it doesn't really take into account the diversity of a, a, gen, a, a, of an, um, a group of people or ethnicity and understanding what are the things that determine outcome in that group and how do you rethink uh, that information that we're getting. In general, the information that we collect is very limited anyway. It's not designed to serve those populations. And I think if we're collecting data for everybody and we miss specific things that we need to collect for a specific group of people we're then we're disadvantaging that group by just not thinking about them um and and that really uh, you know struck a chord for me because i think as clinicians particularly in a pandemic where things are evolving so quickly it's all about information right if you don't have the right information you don't know how to act and if you remember in the beginning of the pandemic everybody was you know worried about all sorts of things you know what kind of antihypertensive uh, medications people were on there may be a signal there all um there may be a signal that certain uh, medic you know medications were effective but we weren't quite sure which ones and over time as we build our knowledge or as we built our knowledge we became much more um effective and combating the the, the, the pandemic 
if we don't collect the appropriate data, we won't know. And I think there is still the reluctance to collect ethnicity data, to collect details that matter to certain subpopulations. Um, we're just not built for that yet. And I think it's because we don't have the right people in the room. If we had more diverse team members in the policy room, if we had more diverse team members in medical leadership, we would probably be in a better position now. So I think, um, you know, diversity in workforce should be a priority. It makes us better um, at dealing with anything, including the pandemic. Yeah. And, and yet in the course of the pandemic, we've made some sweeping changes to how hospitals are organized. And I guess there is the potential for conditions to have actually been made worse for some groups. Yeah. Um, you know, that there may not have been much attention paid to equity. You know, we've been in a position where we've had to make decisions very quickly about hospital organization. Um, it seems that some already steep hierarchies have become steeper inequities are getting worse um, and that will have some knock-on effects for the workforce which may be quite hard to reverse yeah i mean the workforce in healthcare in australia and all around the world really is predominantly female to start off with um, and there's a lot of diversity in the nursing workforce as well but that doesn't translate into leadership both in medicine and um, in nursing and other allied health professions if it doesn't translate into leadership, then those interests of that, the interests of that workforce won't be served, uh, you know, and you, and I guess we risk the, the, the marginalization of those workers and those workers leaving. And we, we, we see that in the US where there is a sort of a mass exodus of healthcare workers out of the workforce because, you know, COVID has been stressful, the healthcare work environment got, um, stretched um, and people's capacities just, you know, they reach their limit. But if you lose people, it's very hard to bring them back. Um, healthcare workers are highly trained. It's an investment that our community and our society has made over many, many years to get expert and specialized individuals to, to look after uh, people in the community. And, you know, it's a real shame to lose healthcare workers. Um, we actually need to catch them before they reach the point of quitting their jobs and address um, adverse working conditions, because these things have real effects on well-being, on the sustainability of working for people. Um, you know, people may become quite professionally isolated or, or whatever it is, but it makes you know, work essentially unbearable. You know, to get to the point where you've actually left the workforce after training for so many years to get there um, is has those negative effects that you refer to and it really needs to be avoided so we probably need to act now don't we yeah i mean i think um <clears throat> there's a reason you know the topic of burnout and the topic of well-being is so in the forefront um in healthcare at the moment i think we bandy around those terms quite a lot burnout well-being um <clears throat> and it's probably in response to some of the information that we got from other countries that dealt with the pandemic or the first waves of the pandemic much earlier to so the UK and the US. No one really knows what to do about it. But um, in my mind, there's a couple of things that will facilitate engagement of clinicians and retention uh, of healthcare workers. People want to feel valued, they want to be seen and heard and feel valuable in their job and they want to be fulfilled and they don't have to be fulfilled all of the time, but there's evidence to say, you know, that they need to be fulfilled 20% of the time. And if we as a profession um, and as a society can recognize that we need to demonstrate that healthcare workers are valuable by supporting them in their work environment and allowing them pathways to fulfillment within their job that can help them become more resilient to all of the pressures we're going to have to endure because this is not going away you know the healthcare system is not designed to sustain this level of intensity for a very very long period of time and you know solutions that are driven uh, you know by this understanding that we need to demonstrate um, to healthcare workers that we value them and that we need to offer them career pathways that you know, help them feel fulfilled with a working environment 
that is supportive and um, inclusive, that is not difficult to do. It just requires a commitment to prioritize that, recognizing that if we don't, we are likely to lose healthcare workers that you know society and the community is highly dependent on. So let's talk a little bit about solutions. How do we actually get there? Um, I was very heartened to see um, that New South Wales Health has introduced shared parental leave, which seems like a great start. Deal, like it's a game changer having shared parental leave. Um, so we need to capture that and drive it forward and make it accessible to all um, and, and encourage its uptake because there's no point having it just sitting there because that's, that's not going to do anything. It's quite likely that things will just continue in, in some ways as they have been unless we encourage its uptake. Yeah, I mean, I thought, take. yeah, I mean, I thought about this a lot and it's great that it's there because, you know, law moves things much faster. Like if you have a policy or a law or something like this, it, it's a game changer because it's there for the taking. But, you know, as many of my female colleagues said to me, I, I want to take the leave and I'm grateful for the leave and I'm grateful that my partner or male counterparts can do it as well. But are they comfortable to take it in an environment that has never really been encouraging of it. It's not encouraging for women to do it, let alone for men to take it. It would take a lot for uh, male colleagues to kind of say, you know what, I'm going to take advantage of this. Is this going to be acceptable from the male dominated, you know, specialties or fields in medicine? Um, you know, I, I've recently spoken to a colleague who was really excited about it. He really wanted to be a stay at home dad for that period of time and take advantage of this, um, uh, new policy, but he was just too stressed to even take it. You know, none of his colleagues or his senior colleagues or mentors or supervisors ever take leave for childcare purposes. Um, so there's a big cultural change that needs to occur in order for it to be permissible, you know, even for a permanent employee. But when you think about people who are on temporary contracts, that they will be strongly discouraged from availing themselves of this leave. The power dynamic makes it very challenging to go against that culture, against your, um, you know, your peers who are not inclined to to take this opportunity, you know, and, and act on it. So I think most people are still going to find it very difficult to face that decision to apply for that leave and take it up. So I'm very interested in the next couple of years to see how it's actually implemented or adopted. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the first, first few months taken care of, but you know, these children kind of tend to hang around a bit longer than that. So I think we probably need to progress to a sort of more of a shared caring arrangement where it's not just women that need flexible conditions and need to leave early or arrive late or whatever it is, that actually everyone does that. Um, that seems like the right thing to do here. Um, what about the role of quotas? You know, do they, do they actually have any role here at all? Of course they do. I think, you know, quotas allow people to aim for something. It, it sets the, uh, the narrative that we have to do something about this. And I think in medicine, people are, are very goal oriented <clears throat> and they're quite competitive. Like if you, if you look at departments where there's been a goal set, um, they tend to compete to get to that goal and feel very proud to achieve those milestones. And there's a lot of programs, both nationally and internationally, that look at women in STEM and trying to improve the numbers in women in STEM. And, you know, there's, there's evidence to support that quotas, amongst other strategies, um, these sort of tiered programs like Athena Swan, for example, in um, the STEM fields, actually do promote change at a cultural and institutional level through policy change, through review of data policies, and procedures to see how they can actually move the needle forward and, and participating in programs like that actually makes a difference. Um, now, the healthcare system is so enormous and so variable, particularly in its resources and its structures. So even for example, in one state in New South Wales, the various area health districts all have very different needs, resources and workforces. So one size doesn't fit all, but if we prioritize from a national perspective, inclusivity, um, gender equity, intersectional lens to diversity in the workforce, we will probably get further than if we don't prioritize it at all. 
um, and you know other countries, particularly public health systems like Canada and the UK and New Zealand, um, we all have very similar health uh, system strategies and policies. They're not the same, but similar in the sense that it's all public um, and it's subsidized by you know the health you know the public health sector is is something we pay for as a society uh, and we should have a say in how that is um, delivered uh, you know the NHS has a lot of um, very interesting programs and, and and strategies to improve health equity and diversity um, you know and people will learn over time of what works and what doesn't but we can learn from other people and we can design our own system specifically for Australia to suit our, our purposes. Yeah, and in fact, some of that work already exists. So the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists has put together a gender equity toolkit, which helps you just to take the temperature of your own workplace. And I think it would actually be widely applicable beyond hospitals as well. Um, I guess what we're alluding to with quotas is, is governance. You know, how, how do we measure um, our attainments here? Um, another aspect of it is, is leadership testing and making sure we've actually got the right leaders in place. That's a, <clears throat> this is something that I feel very strongly about. Um, in my experience, having worked in a lot of places um, and having a career prior to medicine as well, it's, it's very clear to me in medicine that the, the hierarchical patriarchal structure is very alive and well. Um, you know, usually it's a, a, a transition into leadership is through seniority. Um, I've taken a lot of leadership positions in my own subspecialty because I have an interest in leadership. I've honed my own leadership skills. I have a an aptitude or an inclination in that direction. And I've pursued it and, and have been successful in some sense, in the sense that I've managed to get to these leadership positions. But I have to say it's not um, because of sponsorship or mentorship towards that. It was actually in spite of, 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 of some of the barriers that were put in front of me. And I think that in general, my experiences, for example, in Canada have actually been better in the sense that there was more sponsorship and mentorship. People understood what it was to support someone who was more junior or to support someone towards, you know, career progression and success. And watching um, physician leaders in those environments, it became very clear to me that they were selected for their leadership skill. They weren't selected because of seniority. And there was a lot of um, thought uh, given to the leadership qualities an individual had before they were put into a leadership position. Uh, you know, I'd like to see that kind of progressive thinking in Australia where, you know, leadership skills are, you, you have to train, you have to demonstrate aptitude before you're appointed in that position, and that there is turnover based on performance. Um, in general, turnover is very, very, lim you know, low in, in leadership positions. And I'm, I'm speaking on a, from my experience as a medical staff council chair that I've observed over a couple of years now, how appointments are made and how um, leadership positions are appointed and turn around. So their diversity is very limited, that there's still a very strong male predominance in hospital systems in terms of leadership. So I think we need to invest in leadership skills and training, and we need to set a bar for our, our leaders that they have to meet and maintain and improve on to continue to be in leadership positions. I don't think it's something you, you get to when you stay in until you retire. I think that's not good for the health system. Um, and certainly it's not something we see any, in, in any other industry I'm not familiar with all industries, but certainly, um, you know, in my observations in society and culture, that there is a turnaround of leadership based on competence and uh, aptitude. So we just need to make those criteria quite explicit and deviate away from the hidden curriculum. Exactly. Um, the hidden curriculum is something that's <laughs> alive and well, unfortunately. <laughs> Nada, thank you so much. That's been a really interesting and uplifting and inspiring discussion. There is so much there to think about. Um, and I hope we can continue the discussion in person quite soon. <laughs> <laughs>